thank you so much for joining me on today's podcast episode. So before we find out a little bit more about you, I would love to know how working in the later life sector has affected your opinion and views on aging and your own well-being when it comes to healthy aging. Hi Rosaria, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, it would be a pleasure to share with you. Um, so because I work with the elderly, it is something that I'm constantly looking at and reviewing in my own life, in my family life. And to be quite frank, sometimes I find it quite terrifying because it's the one definite thing that's going to happen to all of us, isn't it? We all get older, whether we grow older gracefully or not at all is you know depends on your lifestyle and and how you live and and what's happened to you what traumas occurred in your life so to be quite honest with you I I do obsess over the thought of getting older sometimes and I have to stop myself um but it's also quite a beautiful thing to grow older um grow to a great age the average age of our customers is sort of 89 to 95 you know must be a little bit younger now but um yeah, it's something I think about a lot and I'm reminded all the time of how precious life is. You only have one body and yes, we do accumulate bad habits. <clears throat> um, you know, I'm not going to say I'm perfect myself, but it is something that we need to cherish and look after because if we don't look after ourselves now, I mean, if I knew now, if I knew what I knew now in my 20s, I would have done it a whole lot differently. Like I wouldn't have lived as recklessly. I'm not saying that I was, you know, um, out in the town every night, you know, drinking myself to stand still or, you know, doing drugs or anything like that. But, you know, just the day to day, taking for granted and actually not preparing for even now I'm hitting 40 this year. Um, so, yeah, to say I obsess over it a little bit too much is a little bit of an understatement, but it's it's only natural because I'm I'm reminded all the time every day in what we do. Brilliant. So what do you think is the one piece of advice that you would give to somebody who wants to age well or age gracefully? Just one thing, though. It can't be anything else like your top, top kind of daily routine or daily habit or something that you think has really impacted or it could be an avoidance thing, you know. So it could be like just cut this out of your life or um this is the one thing I definitely encourage people to do every day to avoid. What is that? I think you talked a little bit about habits there and and I think to, to blanket um comment on that is to create um you know healthy habits every day but I think the one that I would love to hone in on is um eat the water or sleep let's go with water because people do get sleep generally speaking um I think if you can hone in on that one in your elder years you've already got that habit there and water has many benefits obviously um to your body and your well-being but when you get older, some of our customers, I mean, if they they might have a cup of tea, quite a few cups of tea during the day, which is still fluid going into their body, but obviously that's got caffeine in it. If you can get into the habit in your younger years of drinking water every day, then when you're older, you're going to prevent things like water infections, problems with your liver, you know, all your internal organs. Um, so I think that's the one I would definitely hone in on. We have, as I said, a lot of customers that um in our business that uh, drink the caffeine or don't drink anything at all or you know they just struggle to to eat or drink sometimes and sometimes that's a case of people just growing older and 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 more reluctant to to do those things um either because they lose capacity or or they've just got out of the habit or there's other things mental health issues going on there but I think if you can build a habit over the years then it's only going to improve or stay with you and that is difficult because you can get swayed along the way can't you like I say to myself when I get up in the morning I'm going to drink two litres of water today um I've got no idea whether that's the amount of water that I'm supposed to drink I just always aim for the two litres and by the end of the day I think oh god I've had like two pints which is not far off I suppose better than nothing but um 
yeah, that's the one I think that I would like to hone in on. So I think that's a fantastic, fantastic point because we often think in our younger years that we need to drink water so we have better skin and we know it's good for us and we know that we need to do it because we feel dehydrated so we get headaches. But the fact that kidney infections and like UTIs and, and different things like that are so common in later life is something we don't really think about. And I, um, I've i recently, since 2024 started, my drink, my water consumption has massively improved. I used to go days of just having two cups of water, but now I'm very on it. And I, I've actually got um, a habit tracker. So every time I achieve 1.5 litres, which is just a bit under what I should be having, but um, every time I achieve that, I take that off. And that's made it so much easier for me. And now I feel so much better. I don't feel unwell. And the thing, the reason that I started drinking so much water is because I kept getting really unwell. So in November and December, I think I've mentioned it in one of my other mm. podcast episodes, I was so unwell. I was ha I had like flu, cold, probably COVID, like immune focused um, illnesses. And I think one of the biggest things that people forget is that water is so important for a strong immune system. And I forget, I forgot that. Um, but now I'm so conscious of the fact that it's not just about my skin and about headaches and different things like that. It's, it's really about preventing myself from getting unwell again, because it was this constant cycle and I just do not want to live like that. Um, but then it gets worse, right? Because our kidneys... They, they go through it. They, once we reach our later life, our kidneys have gone through so much, whether it's heavy drinking or poor diet or whatever it is. If we're not doing the basics like drinking water, our, our kidneys probably aren't going to work as, as well. We'll be able to fight off those infections and, and different things. So I think that's such a fantastic thing. And that's massive food for thought for me. And I'm it's just a little reminder and a booster. So thank yeah. you so much for, for sharing that and I did massively put you on the spot so sorry about that <laughs> um, so good choice so you mentioned that you work with older people now I know what you do but I want to understand a little bit more as to how your journey started what made you go into the later life sector well I initially I started my journey gosh when I got back from Australia from traveling for the year um in 2009 so I might have got my math wrong earlier when I was telling you um but I went into the care industry as soon as I got back and I worked with adults with special needs so um you know things like cerebral palsy um and then I had another lady that I work with with her family um so I worked within their home and you couldn't put a name on her disability but she was non-verbal um and um a wheelchair user so obviously diet and drinking enough water and things like that are really important for, for those two ladies because they were immobile. So the things that we take for granted, walking around on our two feet and getting things moving without going into too much detail, they need help and encouragement with that. So I started my journey um, after... A, a fabulous year of freedom with people that had really complex if I could do this you know um I was only 25 at the time um but as time went on I noticed that I really enjoyed helping people that were more vulnerable than myself well, far more vulnerable um and the path sort of twisted and turned for me um I think I left working with the girls um to get a full-time job in something rather boring I can't remember what it was now um, and then but came back to care again so I had a short break um, I think it was within the print industry and then I came back again to, to working with this young lady um, and I got made redundant absolutely I got made redundant from the, the print job and I'd worked at a centre in that time with my business now business partner Lisa um, working with adults with special needs but we had helped their sister centre which was a dementia care unit um, or day centre, I should say. So we got involved in all the fun bits and bobs, you know, activities and, and quality of life. So we got, uh, we left there and I started working to the print industry. That was it. I'm getting my timeline all confused. And when I got my redundant from the print industry, um, 
I said to Lisa, you know, and the company that we used to work for, they they offer um, home help service. Do you think that's something that we could do? But they are, they also incorporated care into them, so it wasn't like a copycat thing. Um, and so the idea of any little thing came up, and we don't actually provide any of the care or medication needs. We we don't have CQC registration. It's very expensive. That's what all care companies should have to care for your loved ones. So we we tap the home help service. So we get to do all the nice bits and bobs in between, you know, a bit of um, cleaning and household chores, taking people to appointments. Um, so I suppose the underlining thought is, or, or a definite thing is that I enjoy helping people. I enjoy um, empowering them and enabling them to live independently in their own homes and you linking in with what we were talking about earlier you see so many different types of people and you've got stubborn ones you've got really willing ones you've got you know we all know because um we we hopefully most of us been lucky enough to meet our grandparents but when you reach a certain age it's almost like um some people go really dramatically one way and they don't listen to a thing that you're saying and then others go dramatically the other way and they do everything you say or they they can't and they need help to do so so it's been a really interesting journey and one big thing that I've learned is that you can't help everybody people want to need to want to be helped so that can be quite difficult sometimes so we were talking about water earlier it may be that we've got a customer we don't provide care needs but say they have had a water infection and you'll say to them, well, are you drinking plenty of water? Oh, yeah, well, not really, you know, and you sort of go and get them a glass of water. doesn't mean they're going to go and drink it. Um, so that can be quite a challenging and difficult part of our job. But what's important to know is that obviously we're not uh, medically trained. So we will encourage our customers and, you know, help them hand over hand if need be with, with things like drinking and eating and cooking. And um, But fundamentally, it comes down to personal choice. And that can be quite a difficult thing within what we do. Um, but, yeah, we absolutely love it. And it's taught me many, many life lessons, I can tell you. <laughs> I bet. I, I really um, relate to the experience that you had with working with older adults and how that's really influenced your awareness and motivation to live a healthy life now. Because, so my story kind of initiated when I was very very young and I recognized that mm -hmm. most of my older relatives were really unwell or had health problems or were in and out of hospital or GPs or whatever it was and I just believed that as you grow old you get sicker but I, I just thought that was inevitable that as you age you just get your, your health deteriorates and I didn't really understand that it's actually not that's not true and when I learned that I was I think I was at university and it, we had a whole unit about um how physical activity and well-being will massively influence somebody's long-term health conditions and it was a massive light bulb moment where I thought why isn't anyone doing anything to support people with like clinical exercise so that they can improve the quality of life mm. so that was in 2017 2018 and um I couldn't find anything so I, anyway I went away and I started my first business and that was helping people with long-term health conditions um manage them or prevent them from worsening through the power of exercise and eventually I really recognized that I love working with older adults and I've, as as you've experienced I've come across older adults who are extremely physically able or so motivated and have an amazing quality of life and then others who maybe mm. don't have have a fantastic quality of life and a really low mood unable to walk probably just sit around and very sedentary um for most of the week and it's made me know that I want to be that person. I want to be that person mm. who's in their 90s and is exercising, is socialising with her family and friends and is making sure that they have a daily routine and they're not sat on the sofa during the day. And that's the type of person I want to be. And I think as soon as you realise that and recognise that's what you want for your future, it makes it a lot easier to do things now rather than just thinking, 
oh it's just part of aging I'm just I'm, I'll just have to endure it that's what everybody else has to endure is long-term health conditions and feeling sorry for yourself and like kind of this grumpy stereotypical old person which I don't know where it's come from I I, I think it's probably mm. like cartoons or tv or media or somewhere like that where we've been conditioned to think that older adults are grumpy and moody and un unwell and use walking aids and yeah lots of people do use walking aids but that's not just because they're old it's it's nest it's probably more likely to be as a result of sedentary living or an injury or something that hasn't mm. been healed properly so um so yeah I mean deep conversation for a Thursday afternoon yeah <laughs> yeah I know but it's it's not deep for me this yeah. this is the thing like I've got the majority of my friends don't work in the same industry and wouldn't ever want to as myself you know or, or in something medical I really do just touching on something that you were saying there there's a saying prevention is cure and I'm not saying that you're you know could be fighting fit until the age of 99 100 you know that's I can't promise that but if we put in the preventions now, as we get older, and like you said, look after our mental health, exercise, you know, do exercise that's suited to our fitness levels, then as you grow older, you can be that person that has the strong mental health, um, be in that position, you're more positive, and you then are giving your body the chance to continue into later life. If you don't consider that, then you're only going to, in my opinion, make things more difficult for yourself. There are fluky people out there that they just hammer their bodies so hard throughout life and they're like 98. I think, oh, my God, like, how are you still alive? Like, yeah, or they're eating long food or whatever. And I'm like, oh, God, don't tell me you ate that yesterday. Like, please tell me you didn't eat that yesterday. <laughs> Went out of date last week. But for some reason, they're fine. <laughs> Um, yeah. there are some people like that um but yeah I just think always thinking about how you can enable your own body even at a younger age we're all about enablement but if you can even in your 20s 30s 40s you know start putting the building blocks in place to move forward into later life then you're going to be a lot stronger aren't you absolutely so what are things that you do now that that have changed since you started working in the later life industry that are non-negotiables now because you've realized like I want to live this healthy let this healthy quality of life in later life did is there anything that you changed drastically or even just small little changes that you thought I need to do this now because it's going to affect my future I think the biggest thing that I review all the time is um and it doesn't necessarily mean that I do it all the time but it's thinking about my posture and thinking about my back and thinking about um you know how I'm walking and things like that I'm very lucky I've got a friend who's an osteopath and I'm qualified in in Swedish massage so relax relaxation massage so every other week we sort of take it in turns in in giving each other a massage or a treatment but I do yoga or any type of yoga pilates or body balance I try and do that at least once a week um because looking at some of my elderly customers you know they might slouch or you know um have the walking stick or the walking aid and I do think that those sorts of things are really good for your body um so I think it's it's mainly health it's mainly my fitness that I sort of look at but my poor body I'm a horse rider so I've had a few falls over the years and um I've just started riding again a couple of times a week um I think I have to work a little bit harder to keep a good balance because obviously posture can change depending on what types of sports you do um so yeah that's probably the biggest thing um and I do try and eat healthily I do, but then I always have done. Um, I believe in everything in moderation to a certain extent, um, but I've always been quite good at, at sort of allowing myself little treats, but during the week sort of maintaining healthy food. 
um absolutely I think it's all important things it's all about balance and I think as soon as you decide that you're going to ban something from your diet it makes you want it more it's just yeah this internal thing which is mind-blowing and I'd love to read some research about it but absolutely I think it's all about balance and I love that you brought up posture because posture for me is something that is so important it's something I think about all the time um uh, my posture is not perfect and I actually went to a uh a yo no I went to a Pilates class I think it's plus yeah Pilates last night long story short I wasn't supposed to go to the class because it was fully booked but I turned up and thought I was booked on and for a yoga class and then they were like you can't go to the yoga class but you could try and sneak into the Pilates class so I said okay great thanks um <laughs> and uh and I don't really do Pilates very much, although I'd love to, because I think everybody should do Pilates. And I think children st should start doing Pilates from pr primary school, because I think that is going to massively improve people's posture as they age. Um, and it was a really low impact, low level, not hard at all um, class. But it made me realise how bad my upper back posture was, because I was so mm. restricted, so tight, my shoulders wouldn't move properly. I And I just thought, oh my gosh, this is such an eye opener. This is so easy and I can't do it. And I know it's easy because I would get somebody else to do it. And I know that I have been able to do it. And yeah. um, it was a bit of a wake up call. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have to stretch. So I came home after my Pilates class and did more Pilates. <laughs> <to> <laughs> my shoulders Because I was like, this is, this something has to be done. Um, yeah. But yeah, posture, I think. And also the, the issue with posture is you've got bad posture. Is this is people think it's this aesthetic thing that that that's why it's bad but that's not the only reason the main reasons why posture needs to be something that people think about and consider is because of what it can lead to so things like increased falls risks if you're yeah. if you're hunched over and you're leaning over and your your center of gravity isn't in the isn't in a stable position then you're more likely to fall head first you know yeah or spine disease or neck pain and neck ache or you may need to have hip or shoulder replacements as a result of poor posture you know it's like all of these long-term health conditions that can impact your quality of life your pain management your just your daily discomfort hospitalization different things like that that nobody wants to go through but for whatever reason we're not prioritizing posture no. or doing things I know that there's this massive call to um improve um posture within the workplace but not everybody works in an office you know a lot of us are right. working from home or drivers or different things like that and I've said this in my podcast again and I will keep saying it but sitting is a bigger killer than smoking and yeah that is such a dent detrimental area of posture it's so sitting. scary isn't it yeah so so scary so, so scary so um tell us I, I'd love to know more about kind of moments of impact that you've experienced in your life where you have um seen a patient or I don't know if you call them a patient or a service user probably not a patient because mm -hmm. you're not off administering any medication but um people you've worked with and it maybe maybe it isn't necessarily people who are paying clients it could be just people you've supported or family members or anyone like that that have really changed the way you've seen something or or have had a or left an impact or a, a meaningful kind of experience on you with you yeah I'm gonna go with a couple in the respect um that there's two different types of sort of people that have inspired me over the years or left an impact um and I think the the biggest inspiration to me and and um what has pushed me through life is the respect that and probably bear with me on this go on often a bit of a tangent but having worked with people in the younger years and the older years I'm going to do you know a bit about both but we are so lucky to be able to do those things that we've just been talking about and to have working limbs and be able to eat and drink whatever we want 
And so the the lady that I work with, first of all, she really taught me to appreciate life and be grateful for all of the things that we have, which is another big thing that's so important um, as we grow older. Um, I think we live in a in a in a country or a nation, COVID probably didn't help, where mental health is a bit of a low and we are quite negative. And I think it's really important to remember how lucky we are that we are able to move and we are able to age well and and live into our older years um, really healthily. We have that choice. Um, sometimes that choice is taken away from people as early as birth. And I think we really do take that for granted sometimes. Mm. So um, she was a massive inspiration for me and has been all the way through my journey um, in care. And then I think um, another impactful thing, linking in with what you were saying about you've got your different types of people. There was a lady that um, I worked with when I was, um, I failed to mention earlier because it was only a brief part of my life, but um, I worked as a healthcare assistant within the NHS. And um, there was this lady and she, she only had one arm, so she was an amputee, I think, or possibly um, was it formaldehyde, maybe. I don't know. Was that the right word? You know, where they lost limbs yeah. at birth. Yeah, yeah. Um, and she'd obviously been like this all her life, and um, she was sitting there knitting, um, believe it or not, even though she didn't have two hands. And she was really, really positive and like, oh yeah. And I can't remember how old she was now, but she was in this rehabilitation unit, so she would have been you know mid-70s at the at the youngest but I would imagine she was of 80 to 85 and she was just so bright and bubbly and positive and and again it just forced me to sort of review and sort of think if people like that can live a long and healthy life then really we have no excuses if we have all LMs and we are able to do anything we want really aren't we if we've come fully equipped <laughs> um what's our excuse if we abuse our body to the extent that when we grow older we then become miserable or you know um uh, not not very willing to to make a change for the better to provide us with all the abilities you know um so I've been really lucky to meet some some really great people over the years but for some reason, I mean, Alex will always stick out in my mind, but this other lady, she's, I don't know why, I just, I've never forgotten my conversations with her. She was just such an inspirational lady. So, yeah, I think, but I mean, it, most of our customers um, are great and you learn so many stories from them and they talk about their lives and everything. So uh, we're really blessed that we can we can work with people like that and and um listen to their stories so we're quite spoiled really do you think for somebody who's really struggling to grasp the concept of aging and we've got loads of um, stories i can tell you <laughs> <laughs> um do you think somebody if somebody who is struggling with the concept of aging or the concept of uh a health condition would benefit from speaking to people who have been going through it uh through something similar for a long time do you think that that would really benefit them because I I, I mean it benefits me it sounds like it benefits mm. you um because it I guess it it brings or it demonstrates how life still goes on you know and yeah you can live a happy fulfilling life without having what society would call as would call normal you know mm, yeah it, it's a difficult well it's a difficult concept but it's not um I suppose maybe I come across and sound a bit sort of um kind of um uh, I'm trying to think of the word um so that I'm not really sort of giving people a thought that do have those disabilities that may be struggling perhaps listening to this podcast or, or um you know conversations generally that I may have with people but I just at the end of the day everybody's different there are so many different types of people and what helps me what helps you might not necessarily help somebody else so I think it's all about um listening to what you think would help you rather than what other people tell you you should do 
Um, it is, it's a difficult one because you, everyone has their different um, experiences in life and, and possibly different traumas and um, maybe different mental health battles. I might have a glass half full all the time. My friend, very close friend, might be glass half empty. So it's really difficult. My my um, we see all sorts of all sorts of different scenarios in our um in what we do, and sometimes families don't get on and they don't talk. And my business partner taught me something which has stayed with me, and I always remember it is you don't know what's happened in their past and you don't know why they're not talking to each other. And it, it's the same thing. It's the same application. If someone doesn't want to change the way they are, then you can talk to them as much as you want and say to them, I think you should do this. Or and even with the medical profession, they, they may do the same. I think the key is education. And if in summary, if, if we're educating people to understand what the possibilities could be, then again, it comes back to that. They've got the power. And if they want to make the change, they will. Mm. Um, but yeah, everybody's different. And and what works for, for me may not necessarily work for somebody else. And uh, I don't know. You've got all sorts of programs, haven't you, as well, where people work with, they do voluntary work and they learn. Um, sure. or even animal therapies and things like that I think until you do something or until you try it you don't know so in my opinion there's no harm in trying um, Absolutely. and if it doesn't work it doesn't work if it's not for you it's not for you um, yeah but yeah there's no harm in trying okay perfect thank you and something else that has kind of just briefly come across my mind is that I think it's great thinking about these things from a personal perspective, but a lot of us will have loved ones or um, friends or neighbours or, or or somebody like that who may need some support. And I think that your your business um, is, am I referencing this correctly, the little, any little thing? Yes, that's it, yeah. So <laughs> any little thing. I think that's a, such a fantastic concept because... I instinctively think of care when somebody has somebody coming around to the house. It's kind of their old their needs, you know, like domiciliary care. And yeah. I think that there is such a valuable place for what you guys do. What are considerations when somebody is thinking, or oh, I think my loved one may really benefit from a service like yours? Um it, there's, it, it ties in with what I was saying earlier about sort of prevention. I think if you can sow the seed earlier on, then your elderly loved ones um, or vulnerable loved ones can live at home independently a lot longer. I don't know what the statistic is. Um, you know I haven't done any um, sadly when people move away from their homes unless it's what they want to do either due to care dementia or whatever it may be they quite often deteriorate very quickly after that so if you can sow the seed and if, if well a lot of our customers employ themselves if we're going in and we're, um, then we are giving them, we're, we're allowing them to use their energies on the things that they enjoy and love, which then in turn will help their mental health and will allow the family to spend quality time with them. So there's no sort of wrong or right time, but I think if you can use a service like ours um, or whatever it may be, um, then it, just before it's you're at crisis point, then it means then that you're you're sort of, working towards what we've been discussing you know the later years when they might have carers going in um or extra support additional support and it also gets them used to somebody coming in do, doing things for them them because i i was terrible when i was pregnant and i was like oh i hate this i'm so independent so we all know what it's like if you are that way inclined so the sooner you sort of do something like that 
to allow your um your elderly loved ones to live independently in their own homes um then the more used to it they get and and the more comfortable they become with it and then that means then when you have to introduce carers um if you do at a later date then they're more um acceptant of of the idea because not everybody wants wants to be cared for um, yeah and I guess there's a social element as well, isn't there? Because yes, definitely. I think, and I think that that's so beneficial because a lot of people, we as we age, we lose loved ones, we lose friends, we yes, our our kind of our social circle gets smaller. But I know that for me, if I'm going to support someone with some physical health, then. That I might be the only person that they've seen in the last 24 hours, you know, and yeah. that social connection is incredibly powerful compared to what anybody can ima imagine, you know, like you don't know unless yeah. you know what that's like. Yeah. And I can really see the benefits of, of, of what you guys do. Where are you guys based? So we're in Essex. Um, so we're, we're part um, in Billericay. Um, Billericay, Wickford, Basildon and parts of Brentwood in Essex. Um, just touching on what you were saying there as well, we call our cleaning, when we do cleaning, Lisa and I always say, unless the house is a bit dirty and they do need more support in that area, but quite often it's we call it disguised companionship because, you know, you go in and their house is cleaner than my house has ever been, um, but they still want you to go in and have that chat, which is so lovely. Um, but, yeah, it's... So our business itself is, um, as I said, in Billericay, Wickford, Buzzard and, and parts of Brentwood and Essex. Um, and I've just recently started supporting people and they can live wherever um, in, in the UK with finding the right care. Because there's there's a lot of great free resources out there for people to, um, you know, enrol their loved ones in care, get funding, etc. But again, something I've realised um, is the support for, for the loved ones is really important as well because their well-being can suffer as a result of caring for their loved ones. And there's not complicated. So um, I've just started sort of producing a, a programme where I can help um, support people through their care journey and finding the right care and um, pointing them in the right direction. But yeah, I, I've talked so much about my, my customers that are elderly, but we have two um, types of um, clients and, and the other is, is their loved ones and it can be really stressful on them and their bodies. Um, so hopefully all of the advice that, that I've given with you today will be applicable to them too, like the water um, and looking after themselves. But yeah, it's, it's, it, it's quite tough at times. It doesn't need to be. And I think sometimes it can be really overwhelming. So I just want to help as many people as possible to find the right care and, and not have to go through the stresses on the way. Yeah, you sound like somebody who just internally, like it's in your DNA to care for people. And are you meant you mentioned that you were doing the, the print, um, the print job, but that was it to me, it's came across really rogue because all of the other work that you've been doing has been yes. <laughs> care focused you know <laughs> yeah. so it's like it, it, yeah that is a strange one that is a strange one I, I realize that now now that I've, I've heard you say it back to me um <laughs> we've all got to work you know um yeah and unfortunately the care industry you know what if I if I could do it for free then I would I really really would but a lot of time effort and um blood sweat and tears has gone into opening the business and running the business there's there's lots of different things that that come into that um but the, unfortunately the care industry is is not known for paying people that well which is really sad and on a bit of a serious kind of almost semi-political note um I feel that if the care industry or carers are recognized as a profession rather than a vocation then the industry would change for the better. Um, but, you know, you've got carers that, that work in domiciliary care and, and they're earning the minimum wage um, and they've got a lot of responsibility. So yeah. but that's a whole different realm that we won't go into. But, um, yeah. No, I get it. And it. 
before we get sucked into a hole I do get it I worked in Doncare for two weeks during the pandemic and Mm. oh my god I was like this is horrendous you know you've got the company's trying to cram staff (laughs) to see like to see someone within 15 minutes and then you're supposed to get to the next person within such a short period of time Mm. and it's just it's absolute madness and there's no what I noticed when I did it it's like there's no love like most of these people have gone into these jobs to care for people but you Mm. can't care for them because you're told to do a job and you're just getting the bare minimum done you know whereas yeah I yeah not not going to talk about it too much because yeah we can go I mean the fact that you only did it for two weeks says it all really doesn't it (laughs) (laughs) it does I mean it's just don't own a care company (laughs) yeah no and I I guess you probably have to to experience a lot you've probably experienced so much and you're a professional and you're somebody who's got a lot of expertise in that area um so yeah it sounds like you're also emotionally um fueled by the care setting the way that it is in the UK um okay so I just wanted to kind of bring the episode to a close so if there's anything else you think is really important that you wanted to add um feel free I just think um my my parting note will be life is precious just go out and enjoy it you know um live as healthily as you can but I do promote everything in moderation um because obviously we're only human and we're constantly reminded how precious life is and you've got this machine that you are using every day look after it well and um take rosaria's brilliant advice in all her podcasts um and take it forth because a lot of my customers as well will say or our customers i should say um and the people that i've met along the way will say i blinked and i'm 90 or you know I've got um, a son, I feel bad that I've only just mentioned him, um, who's six years old. And and some days I'm like, oh, God, this is so stressful, I'm alive. Um, <laughs> and, and an elderly person will say to me, well, they grow up so fast, enjoy this while you can. I'm like, really? You're some kind of thick <laughs> and twisted person? <laughs> um, but it's so true because I blinked and he's six. You know, so before you know it, you will be providing you you look after yourself you know (laughs) all being well I can't promise it as I said earlier but you can live into your 70s 80s 90s and before you know it you'll be at the other end of your life um so really embrace life and take opportunities and look after yourself as well as you can it's precious amazing thank you so much and I just want to say I don't know how this recording is going to turn out but um there might be a few periods of Oh, some some cutouts because I don't know if if the recording has got it but there were some frozen moments and I don't know if it's my end or your end but anyway hopefully we've got <laughs> all the good content um and fingers crossed thank, yeah thank you so much for sharing your experience and being really really open and authentic and um I love having conversations like this with like-minded people who are really care focused and and want to make a difference to people's lives so yeah, I really appreciate it. And all the best. No, and thank we'll, you. I will tag your business, um, any little thing in the um podcast notes. Um, but if if anyone did want to find you and what was the kind of the best way to find you? Um, well, you can always contact us through our website, um, which is um very easy to remember, www.anylittlething.co.uk. Um, but I'm Lucy Piper on um facebook i'm happy for anybody to reach out to me um and um underscore lucy piper underscore um on instagram um just however you want to reach out if you if you need any help in the area um i'm more than happy to answer any questions and you have a facebook group don't you so you if anyone kind of wants that remote support then they might be able to connect with you there Yes, definitely. It's quite a small group at the moment, and I, I almost I quite like that because then I can give everybody the attention um, that they need. Because obviously, it's quite a delicate thing sometimes. But um, yeah, it's called finding finding the right care for the elderly. Um, and in there, I sort of offer tips and support and 
just um, little reminders um, of how precious life is, I guess, and your relationship with your loved ones. Um, so, yeah, I love it in there. Do come and see us in there. Brilliant. Thank you. No worries. Thank you.